challenge through all of this. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Allison for some meeting procedures. All right, great. Thank you, Julie. And um, thank you, everyone, for um, being here today. Um, the board members, um, just a reminder, you are not muted. Um, so if you but if you do want to speak, please raise your your actual how do I get in there? Your hand, raise your hand um, physically so we can see it and keep it up until um, Ms. Beer recognizes you um, to speak. This is um, the best way we've determined uh, to, to do that, to facilitate that. So be sure to raise your hand to speak and keep it raised. Um, you are visible to everyone um, that is watching the meeting. Uh, we are live streaming this meeting as well. If um, people aren't able to um, get onto the Zoom, they can also participate and watch the meeting via the live stream is available. Um, when we vote, um, we will do a roll call vote since so we can make sure that we uh, record everyone's vote that way. Um, so uh, we'll need someone to uh, make a motion and, uh, and Ms. Bill will recognize that and then and, and the second, um, but then we'll do a roll call vote. And um, you have received uh, the, the board meeting agenda and the attachments and, and other materials ahead of time. So, so you have all of that with you. Um, we are also going to do a, a, a roll call. Um, we don't normally do this since we can kind of see everyone. And, and I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone is, is here, but we're just going to, since it's a different type of meeting today, we're going to do a uh, roll call attendance. And um, the, uh, I'll just go down the list, and this is how we'll do it for the, uh, the voting as well. So um, Julie Spear. Present. Donnie Lewis. Present. Jenny Yoakum. <clears throat> Jenny's not. Jenny's Jenny, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Anne has to do it. And so is Rick. I see Rick Fernandez. But Jenny's here. We'll get you unmuted and then we'll work on that. Um, and Rick Fernandez is next on the list and I see him there. Uh, Daniel Guerrero. Present. Lori Hinky. Present. Brad Miller. Present. Donna Montemayor. Present. Chip Thornsburg. Present. Suzette Tiarina. Present. And Rick Tisch. Present. Awesome. Thank you all again for all um, being here and making the effort to, um, to, to participate um, by Zoom. Um, I thought I would just give you a little bit of history real quick, um, if, I, if I can. In January of 1912, um, the meeting was supposed to be held in uh, Waco, the board meeting. And that back then they kind of traveled around. But they had to move the meeting to San Antonio because there was a spinal meningitis epidemic in Waco and the surrounding areas. And the, actually the board president was not able to get to the meeting because of um, the travel restrictions and they weren't able to travel through the areas in order to get to San Antonio. So I'm glad you all made it, even though we are having this situation um, and we were able to do the meeting Zoom. Too bad they didn't have that back then or, or they could have, uh, the board president could have made it. So anyway, with that, I will um, turn the meeting over um, back to Ms. Spear. Um, for the discussion and approval of the minutes. All right, so board members, um, we were all sent previously the board meeting minutes from our February 4th meeting, as well as our emergency board meeting, which was held on March the 20th. Um, in addition, there was an executive committee meeting held on April the 20th. Um, everybody has had time to review those. And at this time, I'd like to if I can have a motion to accept. I have a motion from Lori Hankey to accept. A second? Second. Brad Miller has seconded. And Allison, if you'll go ahead and take a roll call vote. All right. Um, Dottie Lewis? Yes. Jenny Yoakum? Yes. Rick Fernandez? Yes. Daniel Guerrero? Yes. Lori Hankey? Yes. Brad Miller? Yes. Donna Montemayor? Yes. Chip Thornsburg? Yes. Suzette Tiarina? Yes. Rick Tisch? Yes. And I didn't call you Julie because typically our president doesn't vote unless there's a tie. So don't I think I <laughs> out unless you would like me to record you. No, we're good. I, I realized that was the, the case. 
All right, with that, uh, with the minutes accepted and approved, we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to Megan so that we can discuss um, our adoption of rules. And I'll just remind everyone, please raise your hand um, if you do have any questions um, and, and leave it raised so we can recognize you. As always in your rule PDF, there are bookmarks with links to the lines with edits. Also for the rules for adoption, you have received the orders and the preambles in the OneDrive link that was sent to you. So our rules for adoption, all of the rules that are up for adoption were proposed at the February 4th, 2020 board meeting and were published in the April 3rd, 2020 edition of the Texas Register. First one is 281.35 and on line 43, these provide for temporary suspension or restriction procedures. It may be based on evidence beyond evidence admissible under the Texas rules of evidence. Witnesses can be questioned. Witness testimony can be given by phone. The hearings are not recorded unless there is a timely request by respondent and the respondent has, is responsible for the cost. The board will make minutes of the hearing and will provide a copy to the respondent if requested. Are there any questions or comments in regards to this rule? Seeing no hands raised, can I have a motion? Make a motion. Lewis has made a motion. Can I have a second? Lori Hinky has seconded. Allison, if you'll do a roll call vote. All right, uh, Donnie Lewis. Yes. Jenny Yoakum. Yes. Rick Fernandez. Yes. Daniel Guerrero. Yes. Lori Hinky. Yes. Brad Miller. Yes. Donna Montemayor. Yes. Chip Thornsburg. Yes. Suzette Tiarina. Yes. Rick Tish. Yes. Thank you. Megan. Okay. Next, we have amendments concerning the elimination of the pharmacist intern trainee designation, and these can be voted on together. The first one is 283.2. And on line 93, it removes the definition of intern trainee. Line 105 removes a reference. Line 120 removes requirements that a student intern have completed their first year and 30 credit hours. Then we have 283.4. And line 136 removes the first year and 30 credit hour requirements for student interns. Line 167 removes a reference. And line 173 removes the requirements for intern trainees. And then we have 283.5 and line 47 removes the reference to the duties an intern trainee may perform. And then we have 283.6 and starting on line 76, it removes references to intern trainees. Line 70 clarifies that preceptors must be certified and line 99 removes the fee for duplicate or amended preceptor certificates. And that ends that group. Any questions, comments regarding this group of rules. Seeing no hands, can I have a motion to accept? I make a motion to accept. Um, Donnie has made a motion to accept. Second, Rick Tish. Allison, if we can take a roll call vote. Uh, Donnie Lewis. Yes, ma'am. Jenny Yoakum. Yes. Rick Fernandez. Yes. Daniel Guerrero. Yes. Lori Hinky. Yes. Brad Miller. Yes. Donna Montemayor. Yes. Chip Thornsburg. Yes. Suzette uh, Arena. Yes. Rick Tish. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, Megan. Okay. Next, we have amendments concerning fee for change of name, and these two can be voted on together. The first is 295.1. And line 49 removes a fee for pharmacist change of name because we're not charging for those anymore. And then we have 297.9 and line 54 removes the fee for technician change of name. Any questions or comments regarding these two rules? If I can have a motion to motion. Chip, Thorn Chip Thornsburg has made a motion, a second, okay. Daniel Barrera. A roll call vote, please, Allison. Donnie Lewis? Yes. Jenny Yoakum? Yes. Rick Fernandez? Yes. Daniel Guerrero? Yes. Lori Hinky? Yes. Brad Miller? Yes. Donna Montemayor? Yes. Chip Thornsburg? Yes. Suzette Tiarina? 
Yes. Rick Tish. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Next we have 291.19. And starting on line 47, it updates the administrative actions that may result from an inspection to reflect current procedures and remove some unnecessary language. The updated language provides that an agent of the board may issue a warning notice and provide a reasonable amount of time to comply or may recommend the institution of action against the licensee if the previously cited violations are continuing or the violations are of a nature that a warning notice would not be in the best interest of the public. Any comments or questions regarding this rule? Seeing none, can I have a motion? Motion. Rick Fernandez, Rick Fernandez has made the motion. A second. Second. Donnie has made the second. Roll call vote, please, Allison. Donnie Lewis. Yes. Jenny Yocum. Yes. Rick Fernandez. Yes. Daniel Guerrero. Yes. Lori Hinky. Yes. Brad Miller. Yes. Donna Montemayor. Yes. Chip Thornsburg. Yes. Suzette Tiarina. Yes. And Rick Tish. Yes. Thank you. All right, Megan, I believe that there's something we need to discuss on this one if you'll walk us through it. Sure. So next we have 291.93 and staff has identified problems with this rule and is recommending that you withdraw the rule so staff can work further on it. It turns out the fix didn't actually meet the requirements and for other parts of the rule. So we would be going back to make sure that it does. Um, more specifically, the new label that the amendments provides for doesn't contain everything that a full label does. Um, it would only contain about four things, which isn't sufficient. And we would need a motion to withdraw this one. Motion to withdraw. We have a motion from Daniel to withdraw. Second. second. A second from Rick Tish. I believe we need a vote on that as well, Allison. Mm -hmm. Donnie Lewis. Yes. Jenny Yocum. Yes. Rick Fernandez. Yes. Daniel Guerrero. Yes. Lori Hinky. Yes. Brad Miller. Yes. Donna Montemayor. Yes. Chip Thornsburg. Yes. Suzette Tiarina. Yes. And Rick Tish. Yes. Thank you. May, may, I know we voted on that already. May I ask a quick question about uh, the time frame as to which this may come back to us? We should um, be able to bring that back to you at the August board meeting as a new um, item to propose. So okay. you would um, propose it at the August board meeting. We'll work on that language between now and then. Then if you vote to propose it, um, then you would be adopting it at the November board meeting. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Megan. Next we have 291.155 and this repeals the class H rules because there are no longer any class H pharmacies. All right. Can I have a motion to adopt? Motion to adopt. Second. Motion to adopt from Rick Fernandez. I have a second from Daniel Guerrero. Roll call vote, please. Donnie Lewis. Yes. Jenny Yocum. Yes. Rick Fernandez. Yes. Daniel Guerrero. Yes. Lori Hinky. Yes. Brad Miller. Yes. Donna Montemayor. Yes. Jim <laughs> Thornsburg. Yes. Suzette Tiarina? Yes. And Rick Tish? Yes. Thank you. I have another question before we move on to the next item in regards to uh, 291.93, I believe it was. Uh, I was just curious, are there, what is the, the process to identify uh, rules that are, are no longer needing to be on the books? I mean, I understand that there's no longer a class H, but are there other rules currently uh, existing that may fall into the same category and, and how are they typically identified as such? So when we do the rule review, um, which we'll get to in a, in a minute, that is the time when things that shouldn't be on the books anymore, um, are, you know, should are reviewed. I mean, but certainly anytime we come across something, um, this was um, since something came through with licensing that the, the one class H pharmacy that was in existence had um, indicated to us, they let us know that they closed, then we knew that that rule was no longer needed. Um, but, but the opportunity also is there when we do the rule review. Um, we go through the rules and that's the, um, 
the board and the public's opportunity to, to look at whatever's being reviewed and say, hey, th there's a rule on here that you don't need anymore. I think that's happened. There was, I can't remember exactly what it was, but um, it wasn't too long after we started um, the, re the requirement um, that we went through that rule review process every four years. There was one rule, um, and I can remember, I think it was, uh, brought up that the board you know didn't need it anymore and again i can't remember. i could we could go back and figure out what it was but yeah um, it, it seems like it was relatively i mean i say relatively and maybe in the last two years i remember a similar uh something issue we went through. Mm -hmm. i was just curious yeah yeah Thank yeah the rule review process is is kind of where that's intended to happen but certainly anytime we see something you know that if the staff sees it or if y'all see it um let us know and we can certainly you know pull that um up, you know, for discussion to withdraw. Thank you. Yeah, so, so every meeting we've got two opportunities when we do the rule review and then at the end, remember we always talk about, is there anything that the board wants to bring forward mm -hmm. that it gives that opportunity? Yes. yes. All right, I believe we have one more in this section, Megan. Yes, 295.8. In line 109 adds a one-time requirement for mental health CE, it would need to be reported on renewals received after August 31st, 2021 and before September 1st, 2023. Line 155 clarifies that pharmacists are not exempt from the legislative CE requirements during their initial license period. I'll make a motion. Let me ask any question or comments on this no, one. Sorry. <laughs> All right, so the motion has been made then, the motion to adopt has been made by Rick Tisch, and I believe that Bradley Miller yes, has raised his hand for a second. Um, if we can have a vote on that. All right, um, Donnie Lewis? Yes. Jenny Yoakum? Yes. Rick Fernandez? Yes. Daniel Guerrero? Yes. Lori Hinkey? Yes. Brad Miller? Yes. Donna Montemayor? Yes. Chip Thornsburg? Yes. Suzette Tiarina? Yes. And Rick Tish. Yes. Thank you. All right, at this time we'll move into our proposal briefs of rules. Okay. The first one that we have is 281.65. And on line 47, it corrects a section reference. Line 60 adds a $500 penalty for failing to look up a patient's PMP information before dispensing opioids, benzodiazepines, barbiturates, or carisoprodol. Do we have any questions in regards to this or comments? Chip? Is this time, so adopting it now, we're in sync with our timeline for requiring this? I thought there was a statute that required us. Well, the statute is that we are requiring a lookup, and this just defines the precise penalty that will be. Uh, 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 Okay, I just want to make sure at that time if you know if somebody does that and that way we can I think you know um, we had previously talked about when there is a precise sanction that's specified in the rule that we can do that by um, by uh, just submitting a mail uh, agreed board order to the licensee rather than having an informal conference. So, um, you know, we, we can move move forward with that a little bit quicker. And that's why um, we went ahead and put that in the rule to, to define the amount of the penalty. Okay. I'm fine with it. I just want to make sure we weren't going to go sideways with a some hard deadline we had already set out. So. No, the, the deadline to for the lookup has already started. But this March is just one. To, to make sure that the penalty is also set now. Okay. And our rules do reflect the March 1 um, lookup requirement. Lori? Are random audits being performed to determine compliance with this or or is that a plan or will it be just they present through other sanctions or do we have Primarily a Primarily we're finding out about these um, through complaints and okay. um, you know then we what we investigate the cases and um, we move forward in that way so um, that's that's how we're, we're identifying those types of cases. Very good. Okay. And our Thank inspectors you. can also look um, as well when they're doing yeah. inspections, they can uh, check on that, you know, kind of Thank random you. at that point. I believe Jenny had a question or a comment. 
Yeah, and Chip may have covered this, but uh, was it mandated by legislature that we charge a fee for non-compliance? No, that this is just, you know, we're, we, on certain types of, of uh, violations of the Pharmacy Act where we, where you have determined that a administrative penalty is the appropriate type of sanction, we set those out in this rule in order to give notice to people that that will be the intended sanction. And um, again, if we have the sanction set, then we are using that as a guide to be able to propose a settlement to anyone that is subject to these types of violations um, without the need of having an informal conference. Unless they want to have one, of course, then they can always come in and have that informal conference. So okay. it's not required that we have this rule, but it's in order to sort of expedite those types of violations in terms of the disciplinary process. Okay, thanks. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we will need a motion to propose. This will be a proposal. Chip Thornsburg has made a motion to propose. Do I have a second? Second. Donnie Lewis has made a second. We'll need a vote on that. Donnie Lewis? Yes. Jenny Yoakum? Yes. Rick Fernandez? Yes. Daniel Guerrero? Yes. Lori Hinky. Yes. Brad Miller? Yes. Donna Montemayor? Don is muted. Yes. Yes. Um, Chip Thornsburg? Yes. Suzette Tiarina? Yes. And Rick Tisch? Yes. Thank you. All right, we have a second proposal. Next is 291.9, and line six removes an outdated reference to section 291.155 regarding class H pharmacies, which the board just adopted the repeal of. Any questions or comments on this one? If I can have a motion to propose. Make that motion. Donnie I'll has propose. made a motion to propose. Second has come from Daniel Guerrero. A vote, please. Donnie Lewis? Yes. Jenny Yoakum? Yes. Rick Fernandez? Yes. Daniel Guerrero? Yes. Lori Hinky? Yes. Brad Miller? Yes. Donna Montemayor? Yes. Chip Thornsburg? Yes. Suzette Tiarina? Yes. Rick Tisch? Yes. <clears throat> All right, Megan. Next, we have 291.121, and line 32 adds healthcare facilities regulated under Chapter 241 to the list of locations where remote pharmacy services using an automated pharmacy system may be provided. Um, those healthcare facilities under Chapter 241 are hospitals. And then line 35 removes the limitation that services may only be provided to inpatients at the remote site. Do we have any questions or comments on this one? Seeing none, can we have a motion to propose? I'll make a motion. Make a motion. I've got a motion from Rick Tisch to propose a second. Brad Miller has made a second. Have a vote. Donnie Lewis? Yes. Jenny Yoakum? Yes. Rick Fernandez? Yes. Daniel Guerrero? Yes. Lori Hinky? Yes. Brad Miller? Yes. Donna Montemayor? Yes. Chip Thornsburg? Yes. Ch Suzette Tiarina? Yes. Rick Tisch? Yes. Thank you. All right, Megan. Next, we have 291.153 in line 210 states that the pharmacy is not required to have a sink exclusive of the restroom facilities. Any comments or questions on this one? Seeing none, I have a motion to propose. I move. Donna Monomer has made a motion to propose. Can I have a second? Second. Rick Fernandez has made a second. We can have a vote. Donnie Lewis? Yes. Jenny Yoakum? Yes. Rick Fernandez? Yes. Daniel Guerrero? Yes. Lori Hinky. Yes. Brad Miller? 
Yes. Donna Montemayor. Yes. Chip Thornsburg. Yes. Suzette Tiarina. Yes. Rick Tisch. Yes. Thank you. All right, now we will move into our rule review. Yes. Behind C.3 is our rule review plan. State law requires you to review the rules on a four-year cycle, and you are looking to see if you still need these rules. It's not about their content. And these rule reviews are up for proposal. So first we have chapter 291, and these are sections concerning class C institutional pharmacies. And then we have chapter 303, concerning destruction of dangerous drugs and controlled substances. And we can do these together. So if I can have a motion for proposal. Motion to propose. Suzette has made a motion. Can I have a second? Second. Rick Fernandez has made a second. Allison, if we can have a vote. Donnie Lewis. Yes. Jenny Yogam. Yes. Rick Fernandez. Yes. Daniel Guerrero. Yes. Lori Hinkey? Yes. Brad Miller? Yes. Donna Montemayor? Yes. Chip Thornsburg? Yes. Suzette Tiarina? Yes. And Rick Tisch? Yes. Thank you. All right. Allison, our next order of business is to look at our committees and task force. Can you walk us through um, these items? Yes. Yeah, so behind um, the tab, uh, D1, you have a report on the uh, pilot project that is in progress. Uh, you um, ask um, for the pilot project to give you a report at every board meeting. And so this is their report. Uh, we didn't have them come uh, this time uh, and, and give you anything uh, you know, verbal presentation since, since the meeting is, is being conducted this way, um, but we do have their report there, uh, letting you know uh, that you know it's it's continuing to go on and what's going on there. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, great. Um, and then the next uh, thing that you have is the uh, compounding advisory group. And we were hoping to have a report uh, from that group. Uh, they were scheduled to meet in late March and uh, just uh, right after everything kind of went a little crazy. And so because this would have been the first meeting of the group and uh, they hadn't met in person before, we decided to hold off on that meeting of the group. But you can see behind that tab, the individuals that will be ser serving on that advisory committee. Uh, we are probably gonna go ahead and at some point schedule a meeting with them uh, in the late summer, early fall and it may be a meeting that will be like this, uh, just depending on how things are going. But, uh, you know, we will go ahead and, you know, we don't want to put it off um, too long, but we didn't right when it was initially planned, uh, just, just was not a, a good time for that. So um, the next thing that you have, or does anyone have any questions about that? Sorry. Great. Um, the next thing is D3, and uh, this is a report um, from the Prescription Monitoring Program Advisory Group, and they also um, were planning to have their meeting in April, um, I believe it was on April 6th, and uh, again, we decided to postpone that meeting. They had met in January, they had actually had a chance to meet in January, and they were going to have their second meeting in, in April. We do have a meeting scheduled with them in July, so we will probably go ahead and keep that meeting, but most likely um, it will be a virtual meeting like this and uh, but one thing we wanted to get from that group which we would have done in person in April but it didn't happen um, was we wanted to get um, feedback on funding for the additional features um, that we have for the prescription monitoring program the statewide integration the NARCS care and the clinical alerts and so we just did a, a survey of that advisory uh, group and ask them to give us feedback that way and since we didn't have a meeting. And so uh, they did recommend that we continue to uh, seek funding for those items with regard to the prescription monitoring program. And so we'll talk about those here in a minute when we get uh, to 
the uh, the budget and the, the legislative appropriation request, but that was their recommendation um, from that group. So and you can see the survey results there. Does anybody have any questions about it? Yeah, Donnie. Yes, who, in, who on the board is on this committee? On the PMP committee? Uh-huh, yes. Um, there is not a board member on that. That is a legislative uh, established committee. And there is a specific outline in the law as to who serves on that committee. Okay. So there is not a board member um, from our agency on that committee. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Allison? Seeing then, Allison, if you'll take us to the next session with our financial update. Behind E1.1, you have our uh, quarterly uh, expenses in our budget for uh, through the first six months uh, through February 29th of 2020. And we are halfway through the year as of that uh, point and we have spent about 46% of our budget. So we are right on track with regards to um, our spending and our, our budget. Uh, the first page of that is just kind of a, a real um, large kind of category breakdown. And then there's further categories. If you scroll down, you can see the, the breakdown of those items into, into a little bit more detail. Uh, but that is our um, budget report, and that is is where we are. So it's um, you know good that we're we're on track with with that, and um, you know we're right at the halfway point for the budget. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? Okay. Uh, the next thing is your board member travel budget, and you can see um, just where you are. This just lets you know. Um, you know where we are on our, our spending for your for your travel. Um, just everyone's um, pretty much on track for that as well. All right, and the next thing is there isn't anything because the consideration of material changes to contracts, uh, we didn't have any in this quarter, so um, there's nothing there for you to, to see. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that there, there specifically is not anything there for you to, to look at. Um, and now we're going to go to um, the legislative appropriation request. Uh, this is for the next biennium, FY22 and 23. And um, let me get to my sheets here. So this is um, the start of our requests for the uh, next biennium to the legislature. And so that we are asked to come up with uh, items that we uh, need funding for. And one of the big things that we will need funding for in the next uh, biennium is with regard to our move. And uh, as far as we know, we're still scheduled and on track to move in the summer of 2022. So um, for fiscal year 2022, there are quite a few expenses that we will need. Um, the Texas Facilities Commission is organizing the move and we'll be doing a lot of the coordinating for that. But there are some things that we will need to uh, purchase and need to have in order uh, for us to, to move successfully to the new building. And so um, the first page um, items, pretty much one through six, and then even the person um, number seven on that first page are things that are related to the agency move. Um, so the first uh, several items are uh, computer related, uh, the DIR um, and Azure services, firewall switches. Uh, we will not be having uh, servers at the new building like we do currently at our office. They are not allowing us to, to have a server room. We will be going um, into the, the cloud for our services. And so there's some things we need to get for that. Um, they're, um, they are also not uh, wanting us to take any office furniture uh, with regard to offices. Most of the, uh, I think it's about 70% of the space will be for our office in cubes. 
and that will be provided as a part of the build out. Uh, so we won't have to purchase the cubicles. However, any office spaces that are, you know, an actual, like I will have an actual office um, that will, we will need to purchase new furniture. And so there's some other modifications that we will need um, to provide uh, for that space. And we are working with TFC to get that information and they have not provided us with that exact number yet. So we're, we're working on that. Um, we also will um, get a, uh, a visitor management system um, where we'll have a, an iPad type system where you would log in when you come in at the door, it would check you in and then um, whoever you were there to see would be notified and it, you would come into the, to the office space that way. Um, we're also asking for some additional uh, streaming uh, software and, and things to be able to uh, stream our meetings. Um, hoping by 2022, we'll be all in person, we'll be back together, we'll have our meetings in the new building and the new conference space. And so we'll, we'll have those, but we'll, we would like to um, have some upgraded uh, items in order to be able to do that really well. Um, and also the caption maker so that they can be closed captioned. And then the new position has to do with our records. Um, we will need someone to manage our electronic records because they are also not wanting us to take over very many filing cabinets and paper records and things will be done electronically. All our, uh, all the paper that we have right now, we've got a lot of it already online, but um, there's a significant uh, portion, mostly in licensing that does need to, to get um, electronic. And so we would um, need a person to help manage that. Um, and then we've got several other things, um, a new accountant position, uh, someone to help with our um, accounting and our budget, um, just because as our you know, budget continues to grow and more people, um, it's, just, it's just more um, duties and more things that need to be done. Um, we also need to replace six vehicles in the next biennium. So uh, we are able to get those on the contract for $26,000. Um, but And we do run our vehicles um, for a long time. We don't get new cars, you know, every year or anything like that. Um, we run the cars until the, until the wheels fall off. And so um, there's, and they do have requirements as to when you can get new cars. It's not um, something that, that we, uh, you know, just kind of go get new cars. Uh, but the, there are six cars that are coming up um, that would need to be replaced. We're also looking at asking for merit increases for staff um, across the biennium. Um, our PRN contract uh, would, is, is um, they are asking uh, for an increase into the PRN contract. And so we have that on there. Um, and then this is where the prescription monitoring program that I, I mentioned a little while ago, the statewide integration, NARCS care and clinical alerts. Um, there's the basic PMP cost um, that we have that we had from the beginning, just kind of operating the, the bare bones system. And then we've added these additional features in the last session that was funded through um, a, a special appropriation that gave us money out of the economic stabilization fund or also known as the rainy day fund. And so that didn't um, put any uh, increased expense to licensees last time. So we would need to add that if we were going to continue funding that, uh, you know, ongoing. Uh, we also participate in pay um, cost for um, shared cost for the operation of the Health Professions Council. And they are getting us uh, costs as to uh, what we would need um, to pay for them um, in order to, uh, you know, meet their, their budget needs. And that's something we have every, every time is our, our requirement to pay for the um, Health Professions Council. And then also some funds for uh, up grading and uh, adding inspection reports for the um, in mobile inspection project and adding all classes of pharmacies there. So um, those are the items. These were reviewed by the executive committee in um, April at their uh, meeting and the executive committee did recommend that we uh, move forward and uh, you know that 
the, all of these be presented um, to the full board. And you can see that information um, in further detail on the, on the pages that are after that first um, couple pages. You also have, and then you aren't voting on it this time and you um, don't have to make a decision on this at this time, but when we are appropriated or if we are appropriated additional fees, additional money, um, then we have to make, the fees have to cover those appropriated funds. And so uh, if we did get that additional uh, money, that additional appropriation, there would have to be some sort of increase to the licensees. And uh, we've just come up with some different scenarios for you to look at. Again, this is not anything that you need to decide, but it's just giving you an idea of what the uh, potential, uh, you know, increase in the funding would cause to the licensees. And um, so like if, if we were to receive the, the prescription monitoring program, um, depending on how we divide it up, um, the PMP could be anywhere from, from 24 to $37 for pharmacies and pharmacists. Um, if we receive the funding for um, PRN, we could, it would be an additional um, $2 per pharmacy and per pharmacist. Pharmacy technicians are not part of the prescription, uh, the PRN um, program. And so they would not pay any additional um, professional recovery network fees. And then um, for everything else, again, we've divided it in different ways. So you can see um, how that um, would, would play out um, depending if we um, did it uh, all the same for pharmacies, pharmacists, and technicians. It could be $15. Um, we could do it without adding any fee to technicians, and it'd be $39 for pharmacies and $24 for pharmacists, or we could kind of do it for everyone and, and do a little bit different fee. But again, we can even come up with different scenarios. These were just an idea um, to give you um, just sort of some projections as to what could happen. And that would be sort of, I guess, if you wanna call it the, the best case scenario for us as, a, as far as getting all of our um, requests. And I guess then the worst case scenario of increasing the fees, that would be the, the most um, right now that we're projecting we would have to change. Now, if there were things that were added on by the legislature, um, like last session, we got the, the elite program. That was something that was added by the, um, by a bill, and it was added. And so, you know, that was not something we took into account in the beginning in our LAR. And so, we had to add additional people, and we had to then get increased funding for that. And so, that's just another thing that could happen. Um, but this is just to give you an idea. So, what you would um, would need to vote on. Um, this morning would just be the the LAR request, um, and that's items one through fourteen on the list. All right, the so, recommendation from the um, the executive committee. All right, so Kip has a question. Mm -hmm. hey, Allison, on number five, the moving our services into the cloud. Um, did, did we get those numbers from our IT department? Because that seems actually awfully low. Um, to migrate all of our data over, that's a pretty specialized thing. And I mean, or is this something the state's going to help us do, or is our staff going to have to make that migration? I believe that information came from DIR, which is the um, Department of Information um, and Regulation. Um, they're the computer people um, for the state. And they're definitely that. rough estimates. Um, you know, we know that they're not. Uh, you know, completely priced out in an accurate manner. They just gave us a rough estimate on that. That one just looks like woefully short to me. That looks like the hosting fees, which doesn't cover any of the migration and the setups and all of that. It just, I think it, I don't I know. I think a lot of that we probably will be able to do in-house since we do have, um, you know, network people that work for us. We have a, a couple of people that deal with that in-house and so hopefully um, from a staffing standpoint you know we would be able to handle a lot of that with our current staff um, i think you are correct that this is primarily for the uh, cost of the hosting and isn't the goal over the next year year and a half for staff to be moving their stuff that way anyway so that we're prepared for this yes 
we are trying to get everyone to get everything as electronic as much as possible and you know e-records um we are really working on that and we we are pretty uh close to that this is definitely um being every with everyone working at home has definitely sort of shown people where mm -hmm. there are like sort of the weaknesses in our system that that need to be focused on and need to be uh rethought in order to make them more electronic and more uh, easily uh, put online. Um, but, but we're, I think we're, we're definitely, I'd say over 50% of the way there. Are there any other questions or comments? Julie? All right. Seeing none, then I need a request. I need a, yeah. a motion to approve the request, but I would make the caveat. Um, with the ability for Allison to make adjustments, yes, um, yes, as as come up because it it'll be important that we're just like now, um, you know, we we need to be nimble so that that we're prepared for um, the budget as it comes through. But do I have a motion to um, for this request approval of this request? I've got Daniel Guerrero with a motion, Rick Fernandez with a second. Allison, if you want to take a vote, please. Donnie Lewis? Yes. Jenny Yoakum? Yes. Rick Fernandez? Yes. Daniel Guerrero? Yes. Lori Hinky? Yes. Brad Miller? Yes. Donna Montemayor? Yes. Chip Thornsburg? Yes. Suzette Tiarina? Yes. Rick Tisch? Yes. Thank you. All right. And with that, we're going to go ahead and go into the update concerning um, the program to aid impaired pharmacists. And I will turn it over to Caroline. All right, thanks. So behind tab E.2.1 is the chart, staff's chart that you're familiar with regarding the number of individuals participating with the peer assistance program. Uh, the top of the chart, reflects the participation of the number of overall individuals for the last three fiscal years. And the bottom of the chart represents those individuals that have been added, who started the year with us uh, this, in the first quarter, and then those that were added in the second quarter of the fiscal year. So through February, through the end of February. All right, and I believe that Eden has joined us. Yes, so if there's no questions, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Eden with the Professional Recovery Network to give you the next report. Um, so PRM continues to receive a steady number of referrals regarding potentially impaired pharmacists and pharmacy students. Compliance by current participants is acceptable and all concerns regarding public safety we have reported to the State Board of Pharmacy. In light of COVID-19, we did need to move our seminar to an electronic format, which will be taking place on May 29th, so our participants can still get the support of our seminar. We just adapted it um, as soon as possible so that they can accommodate, to accommodate our uh, new norm. Our presenter is Joseph Gerardo, who is the Vice President of Business Development at Recovery Unplugged. Mr. Gerardo has extensive experience in the addiction field as a licensed chemical dependency counselor, and currently sits on the board for the Texas Association of Addiction Professionals. The presentation topic is titled Recovery and Working, a Path to Empowered Employment. Mr. Gerardo's presentation will provide PR and participants with an explanation of how they can communicate their recovery to others, including the professional and personal environment. The topic is important because navigating employment can be challenging even in the best of times for our professionals in recovery. And there's just so many different layers that make it more complex for those in our program. Um, so Mr. Garner's presentation will discuss stigma, personal disclosures, and the rights for a person it has in recovery. The presentation will also assist PR and participants in their ability to explore payment op employment opportunities to help them better safeguard their sobriety and potentially reduce relapse tr triggers. Um, before COVID-19 um, hit Texas, Karen presented at the University of Texas College of Pharmacy on February 26th of 2020 and Texas A&M University College of Pharmacy on March 2nd, 2020. And both of those presentations included a PRN participant or a PRN alumni 
that um, volunteered to share their personal story of recovery and addiction and the role that PR has played with that. Additionally, we presented on the warning signs and symptoms of substance use and mental health issues to those pharmacy students. At the last TSBP board meeting, I did discuss that we were presenting a scholarship opportunity for pharmacy students to attend the APHA Institute on Substance Use Disorder. Um, and that takes place in Salt Lake City, Utah every year. Unfortunately, this event has been canceled due to the pandemic. And as a result, we will no longer be offering that scholarship. Um, but we do look forward to offering that in the future. So we also have been making sure that we're taking extra steps right now to better safeguard our participants' recovery. We know that isolation puts the recovery community at an increased risk of relapse and can lead to an increased mental health issues. Additionally, our society is seeing a really significant rate of chronic stress. And in the mental health field, we're also seeing an increase in suicidality and mental health stressors and struggles. So what we've been doing at PRN is working diligently to ensure our participants have a full wraparound approach to feel fully supported for the mental health and substance use recovery. So what we've been doing is sending ongoing wellness tips so that they um, have these supports and kind of adapting them as things progress and change. Um, these resources that we send to them via email include online supports, recommendations for their wellness, and um, just PRN program updates. We've been working with our peer and approved evaluators and outpatient treatment centers to obtain telehealth options for our participants. We've adapted our recovery attendance meetings and we've provided them with resources for those so that they can attend those via online, Zoom, or teleconference um, recovery meetings. Additionally, we are assisting participants in locating telehealth resources if they're in need for um, psychiatric or therapeutic services. And we have obtained alternative drug screening options for our participants if they prefer to utilize them during this time. And again, that is a very individualized process. They contact their case manager. We try to figure out what is comfortable for them, but still allows us to ensure that they're safe to practice. So we know that our pharmacists are definitely on the front lines right now. Attached, you will see the PR and expenditure report. And this covers September 1, 2019 through February 29th, 2020. And our legislative budget board members for September 1, 2019 through February 29, 2020 were submitted to the Texas State Board of Pharmacy on March 10, 2020. Um, the LBB numbers include all licensed pharmacists, pharmacy students enrolled in the PRN program. At that time, we had four volunteer pharmacy students. Um, we did not have any board ordered pharmacy students. We had 44 volunteered pharmacists and 48 board ordered pharmacists at that point. Are there any questions for Eden or for Carolyn? All right, well, thank you both for your continued work and, and Eden, especially with the added support and and the ability to, to really take care of the, the pharmacist and those in the program. So I appreciate that. I like the fact that y'all are putting out the, the proactively putting out uh, messages. So I appreciate that greatly. And with that, I think we're to the point that we would should take a break before we start the strategic plan. Um, it is 9.54, if we could all be, uh, 9.55, sorry. Um, if we could all be back at um, five after the hour, I think that that would uh, be great. And Ann, I think you're gonna take care of that. She'll mute everyone till we come back.
we were just waiting on Donnie and Lori. Oh. All right, I've got 10.05 and I see all board members back. Actually, I need confirmation that Chip is back and then we can start again. All right, we have everybody back. Um, we'll call the meeting back to order. Um, our next item of business as you follow through the agenda is the review and approval of this strategic plan. So I'll recognize Allison to cover these information. this information. Right, so behind um, tab E3, you have our strategic plan. And uh, this is something that we are a report that we are required to put together. Uh, you did approve the issues that you wanted to address. And I believe those are on page seven of the report. Um, if you want to see those, um, most of the items in this report are things that um, we get instructions that are lined out as to, you know, on page one, you put, you know, the cover page on page two you have this table you know whatever it's all kind of lined out and what you put in there uh, so we don't have a lot of um, uh, say or, or how it's constructed or anything like that um, so uh, this is something that um, after your approval we will submit this to the legislative budget board and I believe it goes to the governor's office as well and um, you know, it's just a report that um, we're required to put together and send. I don't know if anyone has any questions about that. Um, part of the report at the end is um, our customer service uh, survey report, um, which is also the next item on the agenda. And so I'm going to uh, kind of combine those two things. The customer service survey um, starts on page 67. And again, that is something we are also required to do. It used to not be a part of the strategic plan report. So it was two separate items um, on the agenda. And so it just kind of ended up staying that way. Uh, but it is a part of the strategic plan and you can see that information there. Uh, as well. And uh, we had a, we always have a good response from our customer service survey. I think we had about an 80 percent response rate and uh, all very positive uh, information and responses. Uh, all, all of the categories were um, four and above, uh, except for one, which is historically always um, not had a very good uh, response. It's got a three uh, you know, point whatever. It's always been in the threes usually, and it's um, where was the person happy with um, the resolution of their complaint? And uh, most people, especially if they're going to file a, a um, do a survey, are not happy with the way we resolve their complaint since we didn't, you know, shut down the pharmacy or revoke the pharmacist because the prices were too high or they were rude or something like that. So, um, even though it's it's um, the in the on the lower uh, you know of all of the responses, it's it's still a over you know three point uh, whatever in the number. So it's it's not um, a bad response. It's a actually a three point seven seven. Um, it they uh, you know so it's not like it's even a low three um, in that score. But everything else is is a four point um, and over um, in the in the responses. So um, and that's pretty typical of of the scores that that we get on that. So um, that was good. We also get people can provide comments on um, the survey, um, just sort of a free text comment at the end. And we do get those uh, regularly uh, from the survey. We work with the University of Texas uh, School of Social Work on that survey, and they collect the data and provide it back to us. Uh, we're getting ready to make some changes um, in this fiscal year on the survey as to how we collect the data and from how we've done it in the past. But but they help us with that. We get the responses on the survey uh, every, uh, well, we used to get them monthly, but we do get them regularly. And then we go through those comments and, and look at those. And are there comments on things that maybe we need to 
look at our process. And we've done that on quite a few uh, different things. Look at the process. How, what could we improve if this person had a bad experience? Uh, we also get lots of positive comments. And I always send those out then to the, the staff member um, that if it was, they were identified by name, uh, we get lots of, of positive uh, comments, uh, especially on our licensing team and uh, our, our compliance team, since those are the people that are kind of out there um, seeing the public and uh, we get we get comments on on staff all the time and it's always nice to hear those positive comments um, when people have have good experiences and I like sharing those with them. One comment um, and I didn't notice it until I was reviewing this last night is I think we need to look at the appointment years. Um, when I was reappointed that my term changed and I don't think we updated that. When you were appointed? When I was reappointed or appointed as president. We just need to look at the, the term at the end date. I don't think your end date changed from when you were originally appointed. I'll have to look at the letter. Okay. All but, right. Yeah, we can check on that for sure. I believe the next is um, the review and approval of the calendar of events. Does that require? I, I need a I need a, a vote That's right. and approval on the um, strategic plan. All right. So can we have a motion? I'll make that motion. Donnie Lewis has made a motion, and I believe that Brad Miller, correct yes. me if I'm wrong, has a second on that. We can go ahead and take a vote on the approval. Donnie Lewis. Yes. Jenny Yocum. Yes. Rick Fernandez. Yes. Daniel Guerrero. Yes. Lori Hinky. Yes. Brad Miller. Yes. Donna Montemayor. Yes. Chip Thornsburg. Yes. Suzette Tiarina. Yes. Rick Tisch. Yes. Thank you. All right. And thank you, Chip, for that reminder. Um, next is the review and approval of the 2021 calendar of events. All right, you should have the calendar um, in your in your information, and you uh, will also be working with Anne to schedule the informal conferences. Um, she'll be contacting you um, in the near future for scheduling those. But we do need your approval um, for those dates in the calendar. And if I can have a motion of approval, make a motion. I have Donnie Lewis with a motion. I believe Suzette has given us a second. We can take a vote on that. Allison, go call. Oh, Allison, Sorry. <laughs> Donnie Lewis? Yes. Jenny Yocum? Yes. Rick Fernandez? Yes. Daniel Guerrero? Yes. Lori Hinky? Yes. Brad Miller? Yes. Donna Montemayor? Yes. Chip Thornsburg? Yes. Suzette Tiarina? Yes. And Rick Tisch? Yes. Thank you. I was getting ready for the next item. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. All right. So the next item is a discussion re regarding um, NABP and the proposed resolution. Alice, if you can walk us through those and kind of Give us an update on how NABP will be different this year. Right. Yeah. So NABP um, will be different. They will be having a virtual meeting um, on Mar May 14th, Thursday, May 14th, starting at 8 a.m. And um, it will be just uh, for the delegates to attend and to vote on uh, resolutions and other you know, meeting matters. Um, so unfortunately, it won't be held in Baltimore and we won't be able to attend that, but in person. So hopefully we'll be able to, to meet next year because um, I know several of you are planning to attend this meeting and I was looking forward to, to you know, having y'all come and be attending that meeting for the first time. But um, they do have some resolutions that you received in your materials. And this is just an opportunity to let you know what will be discussed. So in the fall, when the districts meet, they um, come up with resolutions and then those are submitted to NABP and then discussed at the, at the annual meeting. 
And the first one um, is from District 1, and it's a uh, response to the revised USP chapters 795 and 797. Um, and they would be um, providing their, their, the resolution is, um, you know, to provide guidance to the boards of pharmacy regarding adopting these new chapters until the concerns have been reviewed and um, rectified. Their resolution two is um, a response to the FDA form 483, and that has to do with um, inspections uh, from FDA and their observations. And their recommendation is, is to put together a task force um, to, to look at that form 483. Um, district two, they had one resolution. It was also supported by district one. And it had to do with the supplying of biologics uh, by distributors or wholesalers. Um, the next one is from District 3. And this is a resolution that was also supported by District 1 as well as District 2. And it was uh, with regard to criminal background checks and being able to use our e-profile system, the NABP e-profile system for criminal background checks. And I believe that would be um, put a group of members and staff together to figure out how that would work. Um, the next one is District 8's uh, resolution uh, with regard to a data sharing system for the oversight of compounding pharmacies. And it would be a task force that would uh, come up with what information could be shared um, in, the, in the system. Um, and then district, I mean, I'm sorry, resolution number two from district eight has to do with um, high dollar medication reuse and establishing a task force to, to look at that issue. And this issue was also co-supported by districts four and district six, which we are a part of district six. And then the third resolution um, was again with regard to uh, form 483. Uh, this was the resolution from District 8 and um, have a uh, group look at that. And it was also co-supported by our district, District 6. So this is just um, some information, just letting you know items that will be discussed at the meeting uh, on the 14th. I guess that's next week. All right. I would encourage you if you've got any comments or, or questions on those to um, get with Allison and I before the 14th so that we can um, represent you well. Yeah, Julie is our uh, voting delegate and will be attending in that capacity. All right. Um, next is our report on the prescription monitoring program. Allison, if you could walk us through that. Yeah, so behind the, the next tab is um, the prescription monitoring program report, and it is just uh, an update on the uh, statistics uh, from the program. You can just kind of see the numbers and how many prescriptions are being reported, uh, how many searches are being done. Uh, who the people are that are registered, the states that we're connected with, and I'm just giving you an update on the on the PMP. Are there any questions on the PMP? Hey, Allison. Uh huh. How is the the PMP program working in terms of stability? Any issues that uh, coming up, going down, offline? Any problems with it so far? Not, I am not really aware of any problems. Every now and then we'll get a, a message that there may have been like a like a little bit of downtime or something. But um, from everything I hear and everything I've been told, it, it's running really well. Um, we've got, we always get lots of uh, positive comments. A lot of people have um, liked that NARCS care score that we've added. Um, people appreciate the ability to have the integration. Uh, so usually we get. I'd say for the most part, the comments we get are, are good and positive. I mean, you know, we're, there's always people that um, have a problem or unhappy or whatever, and we, we get negative comments, but I'd say the, the positive uh, outweigh the negative comments that we receive. Thank you. Lori? Do we have any indication if the medical board is um, applying any penalties or fines for the physicians who are not adhering to their end of the deal? 
we don't have any information on that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Hearing or seeing none, I will turn it over to Kirsten to give us a report on appeals and hearings. Okay, thank you. All right, first of all, um, just to give you a quick update um, on the Garrett case. This is the case that I've mentioned to you um, for the last few board meetings that was filed against the Board of Pharmacy and against the Medical Board last summer um, by two physicians that want to, um, that are challenging the law about dispensing prescriptions from their offices. Um, we are continuing to work with our Attorney General representative on that case and um, still going through the discovery process. Ms. Benz did have uh, her deposition taken in that case. That was um, on March 12th. And um, we deposed the plaintiffs in the case as well. Um, and we are continuing to work um, on the discovery and then we'll be working on motions uh, through the summer, and then if a trial is to be held, um, then that would probably be set in the late summer or early fall. Um, so if you have any questions about that, let me know. And then secondly, um, we have another case that actually has been, had been pending for an extremely long time. Uh, it arose from a board action that was taken back in November of 2015. And um, the, uh, the action was based on a failure to disclose a criminal offense on a licensing renewal application. And the individual that, um, his name is Trent Griffin, that um, was subject to that disciplinary action did not appear at the informal conference. And so the board took a default action against him for a $1,000 administrative penalty. That ultimately led to his revocation when he failed to pay the administrative penalty. He filed suit um, an appeal in the Dallas um, District Court and then essentially disappeared. Um, and we, we actually even filed a motion to dismiss for one of prosecution. Um, and then since the February board meeting, he has reappeared and um, has been uh, communicating with the, um, the court, and um, we are now actually moving to trial on that. We attempted to have a Zoom trial yesterday morning on that case, and um, it was technologically did not work out. So um, we are reset for Thursday, and um, we should have a final decision for you in that case by the next board meeting. So um, you know, he's, he's challenging the default procedure um, that we use there. Any questions for Kirsten? <clears throat> Thank you so much, Kirsten. Thank you. All right, Allison's gonna give us your report on the agency's um, activities in response to COVID-19. <clears throat> right. All seeing my screen? Yes, ma'am. Okay, awesome. All right. Well, I just wanted to just give you all kind of a quick update on what was going on uh, during this uh, last few months. I think you know a lot of this, but just to kind of recap what we've been doing. Um, let's see here. I guess I want to go forward. There we go. So, you know, everyone had to start washing their hands. And um, so just I thought that was kind of funny. Um, but you know, March 13th was the day that the governor declared the state of disaster in Texas uh, for COVID-19. And we had already started working on getting employees to work remotely. And then, and that Friday we started issuing people that didn't have laptops, getting them laptops. And by Monday, uh, everyone was pretty much working at home. Um, I invited people to send me uh, pictures of themselves working uh, from home in their, in their new office space. And, uh, you know, people have uh, 
new office mates um, instead of the people that they had at work, their, their pets and their, their kids. And so it was kind of fun getting to see everyone um, where they were working and, and how they had set up their, their office space. Um, on March 19th, that was one of the first things that was uh, kind of the rules that was um, changed for the emergency. And that would allow pharmacists to dispense the emergency refills, except for schedule two drugs, uh, if you can't reach the prescriber. There was a lot of people wanting to, to get that. And so we put that into place. Um, we also set up our COVID-19 uh, uh, website uh, with information and resources. And uh, we've done that usually for other uh, disasters. We've always had something at the top um, you know, for the hurricanes and things like that, where people could go and get additional information as to what they need to do uh, with regard to pharmacy stuff. Um, on March night, uh, 20th, uh, we held the emergency board meeting to address the dispensing of the hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine and other drugs um, that you all participated in. And uh, we also on that day received several uh, rule waivers from the governor's office. Uh, we started working with them right away on, on different things. And so on the 20th, uh, these were the rules that were initially uh, suspended. Um, and these, these rules, as well as all the others that are, that are in this, uh, the governors said that they are suspended until the disaster declaration is, is lifted or until um, the governor, if the governor were to say, you know, next week or something that these particular items are expired. So um, these will, will remain in place until that declaration expires or um, the governor indicates that they have been expired. Um, again, on March 27th, we received a few more uh, waivers for um, some additional things. Um, we also, uh, the next week, held our first virtual informal conferences. Uh, Julie and Donnie were the board members that uh, participated, and it went really well. Um, our staff, um, you know, was, got very organized with, with operating the Zoom meetings and having the uh, participants, um, the, the uh, respondents come to the meeting, and it, it really went really smooth. So that was uh, a really great uh, thing from, from the staff. Um, then we got a few more. This was the last uh, set of waivers that we, we received um, from the governor's office. Um, it seems like things are uh, kind of settled down with regard to getting those waivers. Um, the only one that we're still um, have been in discussions with is with regard to uh, testing and, and how pharmacists can participate in the testing. But um, otherwise, um, that's uh, where we're at with, with the rule waivers. Um, and then this was sent to me uh, from a former board member. I think this was in the San Benito uh, paper um, showing that the superheroes and um, the pharmacist is included there. So I thought that was kind of a fun uh, little, little slide there. But, um, you know, we really, uh, the pharmacists out there on the front lines, you know, they are, are being superheroes and, and doing a lot uh, to help people. And so we really appreciate everything that, that they are doing out there. And then our staff has, has been doing amazing things. Um, everyone is, is working and continuing to, to do, you know, just great stuff. They're, they're coming up with, you know, problem solving things when we can't get it done way we used to getting it done so we really appreciate you know everything that's that's going on there so um that is all that i have and i'm going to remember how to make someone the host all right while she's doing that um i echo her comments you know the informal conference really um went very smoothly and and I would like to specifically recognize Andrew Skoll and Lily Marina for you know all that they've really done to coordinate um, our IT and and really help to make sure that all of us had the tools that we needed not only for informal conferences but but for this meeting as well um, but the entire staff has done an incredible job so I, I really appreciate that. Um, Allison, I think next on the agenda, if you'll discuss the possible statutory changes. Yes. So um, the next. <coughs> Allison, before you go on, can I yes. just ask, um, what is the status on the testing? 
so the governor, we've we've had conversations with the governor's office as well as the uh, medical board, and um, the pharmacist can do CLIA waived testing. Um, however, they cannot order the testing, which involves um, asking questions uh, to determine who or who should not receive a test. It, that is where we are right now. So as long as everybody that comes to you is offered a test and given a clear wave test, we're able to do it, correct? Correct. So every single person that walks up, if we say, do you want to have a test, then we can test. But if we only ask certain people, then we can't test. Unless you have a protocol, a standing protocol from a physician. If you, and I believe that's how Walgreens is doing their testing <laughs> is with a protocol. Um, you can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, Rick, but um, they have a protocol um, with a physician uh, to provide that uh, test and that order. And we've, you know, had ongoing discussions um, with the governor's office trying to expand that. Um, and that's just where we are. Right. Yes, Rick. I think, I think the issue involves the, the, what was being termed as screening uh, questions that were the guidance from, you know, the qualifications to receive the test. It is my understanding that the CDC relaxed those uh, requirements. So um, would that change uh, the, um, you know, the ability just to offer to anybody? Do we, do we still need to have a protocol in, in your opinion, Allison, or, or what do you think? Currently, based on what my discussions with the governor's office have been, yes. Okay, to clarify, he's asking, the question was if it's a clear wave test and you're no longer screening, Rick, you're just offering. I mean, technically, yeah, technically on on the on the site, it's still screening, asking questions, but it, it's because it's like that. Every everyone everywhere has that set up that way. I think now the asymptomatic patients can 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 get the exam uh, test. So um, the screening portion would not be as critical as it was in the first portion of when it was first rolled out. So it's the. the Right. That was my question. With yeah, if you're not screening, if you're not screening, then the the my understanding from from the governor's office, if you're not screening, then you you don't have to have the protocol. And it's, and it's treated as a clear waiver test, and clear and waiver. if it's clear waiver, there's no need to have a protocol. So okay, just make sure that clar that clarification it was it was it was touch and go to try to get the thing started. Obviously, I know we worked through it. You're working with the governor's office. Uh, I just think that. Um, um, you know, we were trying, everyone was trying to provide a service for the betterment of the community and the roadblocks were just, you know, disappointing at, 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 to try to have them to, for others who wanted to do them, you know, so I, I think, I think it's just something you got to work on in the future to try to work with the medical board, explain to them that we're just trying to provide a service that patients are needing to help identify what, what, what where they stood, you know. Right. Any other questions or comments? All right, now if we can go to EN, which is the statutory changes. And this is just if there are any statutory items relating more to the board's operation that um, you would like to, to comment on or suggest. I think we had this on the agenda last time and nobody had any suggestions and that's fine. All right, we'll see none. If you want to go through our 86th legislative session and see where we are, which I think we've made great progress on. Yeah, I think we are just about done. So behind that um, tab, you've got a, a copy of, of our chart of all the things that we've been working on. And I think um, the few that are outstanding uh, from uh, from the chart are things that will be addressed at this meeting um, with your adoption of the of the rules. So we should be pretty much um, done with with getting all those things in place. That's just for your information as to where we are on that and getting all those things taken care of. So um, unless anybody has any questions about those items. All right, 
right, well, seeing none, um, we did uh, participate um, in two accreditations. So um, Lori went to Texas Tech and I attended Texas Southern. So Lori, if you wanna tell us a little bit about your experience on that and, and your tech accreditation. Yes, I was involved in the Texas Tech um, School of Pharmacy accreditation survey last fall. And uh, the first time I was able to participate in one of those surveys in this capacity, it was a great opportunity. I learned a lot, but I think most compelling was um, seeing the degree of intensity that um, those programs are scrutinized as part of the survey process. Um, overall, there were some findings. Those are being addressed with Texas Tech University. The survey team visited all of the campuses at Texas Tech. You know, they have campuses in Dallas, Abilene, Lubbock, and Amarillo. And there were pieces of the survey team at all of those. I only participated in the Amarillo campus survey, which was a three-day involvement. Um, again, they, they did have some findings, made some suggestions to the program. And um, certainly overall, I can state that that survey was performed at a level that makes me feel confident that, um, the, that they are doing their job in appropriately surveying the, our educational programs. And I would say that my, uh, you know, that what occurred at Tesco Southern was very similar. Um, ACPE is extremely thorough. They look at um, every avenue. They um, look at the facilities. They, they look at the faculty. Um, they sit down with preceptors um, without faculty there so that they can honestly um, look at what the program is doing. They are very thoughtful. Um, but again, very thorough in what they do. Um, the real goal is, is obviously to give feedback and for them to, to look at how to, to better the program. So I appreciated the experience and the job that um, ACP does. Um, so if you're ever asked to do it, I would encourage all board members to participate where you can. All right, if there are no comments or questions on that, I will turn it over to Caroline. Okay, well behind tab F1 is the board's chart on the complaints that were closed in fiscal year 20. And this adds for you um, everything through the end of February. So you can broken down by quarter so you can see the complaints that were closed in the first and then now in the second quarter of your current fiscal year. And the second page is a comparison between this uh, current quarter of fiscal year 20 to the, hourly, or the quarterly average for fiscal year 19. You can see uh, how complaints are being closed and uh, with what action. And then um, following the chart on compl closed complaints, then F behind F.2 is the open complaints. And the top part of the chart is the comparison of the last five fiscal years of the number of complaints that were received versus closed in the average resolution time. And then chart two is your uh, report on the act, open complaints. And this is as of April 7th of this year. You have the total number of complaints and then um, they're broken out by age. Have there been any challenges with everything that's going on as far as um, processing? And completing cases. I think our staff is doing really well. Um, they're just rocking along. Uh, you know, it's very beneficial that our complaints have been uh, maintained in electronic format for about 18 months or so now. So that's really, they're very familiar with working with uh, electronic case files. And I think that's really helped.
Any questions for Caroline? Oh, Rick? Hey, Caroline, has the staff had any issues traveling around and getting to the uh, complaints uh, uh, efficiently? Uh, how, how has that been? Yeah, they're pretty cooped up. Uh, a lot of the, get, the field uh, investigators definitely wish they were out there uh, doing their job. Um, they've really adapted well uh, to uh, working from their desks and performing desk investigations, using the telephone, um, communicating via email. It's We've been pretty successful with, with, with working the investigations that way, but I know they miss that uh, personal interaction. We talked about implementing additional measures um, to uh, allow them to also do video um, investigations. Um, so we're going to be going forward with that as well to do some training with them on that. Yeah, we had, um, you know, they, I think the more familiar they get with utilizing Zoom and things like that uh, mm -hmm. could, could benefit them to further investigation. Well, as always, I feel like y'all are doing a great job and it shows in the numbers. Anything else for Carolyn? All right, with that, we will move into our disciplinary orders. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not going to go through each individual item um, on the chart as I normally would. Um, you've had, had the, the orders uh, starting a couple weeks ago, and we've updated y'all a couple times on those. And hopefully you've had the chance to review all of the orders. Um, so <clears throat> what we would like to do is um, just have one motion to adopt them, um, unless you have questions, for both the disciplinary orders, both public and confidential, and then also for the remedial plans. And we will um, take care of recusing anybody that we normally would recuse based on your um, business affiliations. And if you needed some additional recusals, you can let us know that. All right, as Kirsten has said, we, we all had ample time to review those. Is there anybody that has any concerns or questions over any particular? Again, the, the remote Zoom went quite well. Seeing none, if we could have a motion to adopt. So moved. I have a motion from Lori Hinky and a second. Second. Second from Daniel Guerrero. If we could have a vote, Allison. Tony Lewis. Yes. Jenny Yocum. Yes. Rick Fernandez? Yes. Daniel Guerrero? Yes. Lori Hinky? Yes. Brad Miller? Yes. Donna Montemayor? Yes. Chip Thornsburg? Yes. Suzette Tiarina? Yes. Rick Tisch? Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. <clears throat> all right, um, Allison, we have a few miscellaneous um, topics, if you will walk us through those. Yes, so uh, for the August board meeting, uh, we will tentatively plan to, we postpone the discussion on pharmacy technician ratios and expanded duties. Uh, since this meeting was not in person, we felt that uh, we wanted to be able to have uh, lots of uh, public interaction, comments, and uh, good discussion among the board members as well. and. Uh, doing it this way um, actually was not that bad. I think it went really well, but um, I thought it would be uh, much better to have that uh, opportunity in person. So um, we're tentatively postponing it until August. We'll see what August looks like as we get a little bit closer and what the plan is for that meeting. Uh, but, but that item is, is um, on hold. And then if there's any other items that uh, you would like to have considered for the board meeting agenda, um, you know, you can let us know now, or if something comes up 
we just need to have it about a month before the board meeting so we can uh, get it on the agenda and get materials or whatever is needed um, if you think of something between now and then. All right. And our and then, upcoming meetings. Yeah, then we also have our upcoming um, the informal conferences for technicians that will be held tomorrow and then the upcoming informal conference dates in June and July. And then the next board meeting is scheduled for August 4th. And for the informal conferences, you know, uh, Anne and uh, Amy work with you on, on communicating your, your attendance at those. All right. Is there any other points of conversation or comment that we have? Brad, I've got a question. Yes, Brad. Um, are we mandated by the legislature uh, or our uh, agency to have um, live in-person uh, board meetings? Um, you know, like, obviously this one's virtual. I got that. Uh, where I'm going with this is I'd be interested to know how much of a cost savings uh, the agency is um, saving by having these virtual meetings as opposed to the live meetings. So the Open Meetings Act requires you to meet in person. The governor waived a bunch of provisions for the Open Meetings Act for this particular time frame, so that's why we were able to do it this way, uh, because of the uh, waivers that the governor's office issued in order to have uh, meetings this way. Um, I don't believe you could have these meetings like this under normal circumstances. Or what? What about the IC uh, conferences? Are those that is something that we could look at. Yes. Mm -hmm. but no, those are not required to be live. They're not actually meetings of the board. And so um, we can we can definitely take a look at that. And um, you know, we'll see after we have a few of those under our belt. We just had the one so far. And you know, we, we had a few uh, technical issues, but um, for the most part, I think it went really well. And, um, you know, we'll see, we have, we'll have an, another board member tomorrow that has not um, gone through that. And we'll, we'll get your feedback and see how you'd like that. And I think, you know, most likely the June and July will also be conducted via Zoom. And um, uh, amazingly, it might be more work for our staff <laughs> than the, um, the, the live ones, because it is pretty amazing what's going on behind the scenes right now to make sure that this is running smoothly. We've got a, a lot of people that are that are monitoring everything as we go along. And the same thing has to happen for the informal conference in order for those to go to go smoothly. Okay, thank you. We did discuss like emergency hearings that this could be a, a, a very viable platform. So, um, yes. but as Kirsten said, definitely a lot going on behind the scenes. That's why I wanted to call out Ann and Lily because they really, are, are yeah, doing we, and Amy and Shada Amy as well. Shada, there's <laughs> a bunch of people <laughs> that Shada. are definitely really making this happen uh, so that, you know, I can be talking to you and calling roll and, and making notes and all the things. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of, a bunch of stuff going on that you don't really see while you're just sitting here watching the meeting happen. And thanks. Cause I, I did need to call out Amy and Shada as well. They really, Phenomenal job by the entire staff. So if there, is there any other points or questions? If not, then I will entertain a motion to adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn from Daniel and I believe there was a second hand from Rick Tisch for that to be seconded. So with that, um, barring any objections, we will adjourn this um, Zoom meeting of the board and thanks to all the board members for their participation in this, for the public that attended both uh, online and via phone, and again to the staff because I know that this was an incredible amount of work. So thank you all and hopefully we will uh, be post-COVID soon.
Thank, thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.